Welcome to the Business Podcast, where we interview professionals across all industries. Hey, it's Simon. Welcome back. Today we have Dilip Rao, a former venture capitalist, now turned a reverse venture capitalist. Dilip, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Maybe you can kick us off. Tell us a little bit about yourself and share something that most people would not know about you. Well, today, most people would not know that I used to be a venture capitalist because uh, I seem to be ranting and raving about uh, the problems with venture capital. But venture capital has a place. So I do uh, think of uh, entrepreneurial development as a balanced approach. So basically what they won't know if they just know me today is that uh, I do look at the broad broad spectrum of how to develop entrepreneurs and uh, want to do it both in uh, the high income areas and in the low income areas. I've worked a lot in low income areas in this country and around the world. And uh, I want to see if I can help in any way. Phenomenal. And maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you got your career start. and walk us through that journey of uh, what you did then to what you're doing now. It would be really good to get that background. Uh, Sure. Well, basically, it was a little bit of an accident. Uh, I was finishing my PhD and I had no money because I I was a foreign student and needed some money for computer time. And uh, so I got a job in in the summer and the job was in a small uh, area venture capital firm. And by the end of the summer, the president of the firm felt that I had the talent and I knew that I had the talent uh, in that area. And uh, so he asked me to stay on and I said, fine, if you make me the vice president. And uh, he used some choice words that I won't repeat, but uh, he said, I'll try it out for three months. And within four weeks, he said, the job is yours. And I basically retired from that about 23 years later, uh, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because I had two young children, wanted to see them grow. And uh, my wife nudged me in that direction. So, and that's the best thing she ever did, uh, other than marrying me, of course. And uh, uh, so I left that and became a professor. And the reason I became a professor is another story. Do you want me to go into that? Please. Well, near the end of my financing career, I became a consultant to the federal government, and they used to uh, uh, they used to send me to some low-income areas around the country that they had funded, and uh, I had run five companies. All of them were turnarounds, which means they were failing companies, and we bought them to turn them around, and we succeeded on four, uh, some of which was the federal government's money. And so they knew about me. And so they asked me to go to these low income areas. And one of the things I realized at the time, because sometimes you live in this narrow world and I lived in the world of finance and venture capital. And if I liked it, you funded it. If I didn't like it, I didn't fund it. But here there were companies that were failing even though they had plenty of money. So I had the opportunity to study them, to see why they were failing because that's what I had to report back to the government and to help them if I could. And essentially at the end of that, it was about a year or two years, I went to the government uh, and told them that they need to send me up front to train them in the skills that they need and not to do a post-mortem or to try to resuscitate a dying company. And they didn't have the money for that, so I quit it and decided to teach because I had a PhD and uh, uh, try to find out what kind of skills do we really need? Because there is still a gap in entrepreneurial development. Uh, People think a pitch competition gives uh, insight into potential. No, it doesn't. Uh, Just so you know, 10 people turned Steve Jobs down. 10 VCs turned Steve Jobs down. And this is after he had started the company. He just turned out to be one of the greatest entrepreneurs of the last 50 years. 
So my reaction is, we can't tell by looking at people's eyes. We can't tell by looking at their pitch. Yet half the world is enamored with pitch competitions, which to me is basically crap. And uh, so I essentially uh, decided to study what skills, what strategies did these people use to bridge the chasm between the idea and what I call aha. Aha is when anybody can see potential. Mark Zuckerberg was getting 10,000 new visitors, uh, people joining up a week. It wasn't difficult to see that he would become big. So that's what AHA is. And so how do you circumvent, I mean, bridge that gap? And that's what I've been studying for the last uh, 15 years. And I have uh, written two books on that and uh, I hope people like it, but that's the whole goal. Not, you cannot tell potential by pitch competitions. Business schools are wasting money. Let's get to some real stuff where we teach people skills and let them prove to us that they have the skills to fish and not just boast about how big a fish they can catch. So that's where I am. Thank you for sharing that. And it, it, it definitely paints a lot of color to the picture of how you pursued what you did. Um, you just mentioned how you've been working for the last number of years in this area. And now that you classify yourself as a reverse VC, your most recent work, Nothing Ventured, Everything Gained, is a really unique story into not necessarily the rejection of venture capital, but the acknowledgement of how you shouldn't romanticize it and wait until the right moment. But maybe you could talk a little bit more about your thought process behind writing that book and um, what you think are some core takeaways outside of what I just mentioned. Sure, basically there are two books. One is Nothing Ventured, Everything Gained, and that deals with the business secrets of billion dollar entrepreneurs. And the second is the finance secrets of billion dollar entrepreneurs and the name is finance secrets of billion dollar entrepreneurs. And if you go to my website, dilipraw.com, you will see both books. Uh, the, I came to that in a roundabout manner. Uh, what I did after I started teaching is uh, uh, started inviting some fantastic speakers to my class and the speakers I was fortunate. I was teaching at Minnesota, and Minnesota has developed more Fortune 500 companies per capita than in any other state in the country. And uh, many of them, the founders, came to my class, and uh, and they would talk about how they started. It was just a cornucopia of wisdom, entrepreneurial wisdom. And so it wasn't someone who started a business went to one million. You know, that's wonderful. But these were people who went to a billion and more in both sales and valuation. So it wasn't the funny money valuation of Silicon Valley. And so I started studying about how they did it. And to my surprise, most of them took off without venture capital. Only one person got, it, got venture capital after takeoff. And that was a company called Medtronic. And the entrepreneur, his partner died and he was a tech guy and the partner was a business guy. And so essentially, uh, they brought in a, a business president, a CEO. But otherwise, they all learned the skills. And so then I decided, okay, let me find out how many there are like this. And I found about 30 of them who had gone from zero to 100 million or zero to 1 billion in, in that range and uh, interviewed all of them and came up with a book called Bootstrap to Billions. So these were actual case studies of how they went about doing it. So there were about 28, I think, in that book. And two of them didn't want to be interviewed. Once I had that, then I basically was looking at it and saying, how can we go from case studies to actual, uh, this is what these people did. So I'm not saying this is what you should do. Every entrepreneur should decide for themselves what they should do because you never stand in the same stream twice. Uh, but this is what they did. So. All my writing is about what people actually did to build billion dollar companies. This is the common wisdom, uh, as opposed to one person standing up or somebody not even having started a business saying, I know how to start a business because they took uh, some classes. Uh, and that's where I came up with these two books. 
And the first one, nothing ventured, everything gained, deals with the first two steps of starting a business. And that is, how do you find the right opportunity for you? Where is the right opportunity? How do you find out that it is a growth opportunity so that you don't go to just 1 million or 2 million and nothing wrong with 1 or 2 million? But my reaction is, if I'm going to spend my life in entrepreneurship, at least my goal should be a billion. I might preach 100 million or 10 million. I'll say, hallelujah, thank you. But at least have a good goal, uh, a high goal. Uh, and uh, so how do you find the opportunity to grow? So that's the first step. The second step is, so how do you find the right strategy to win? Because this is the interesting point. The whole concept of first mover, and I hear it all the time on radio and TV and all these experts talking about it, is basically crap. Uh, and I use that word frequently, so excuse me. Uh, but only 11% of first movers actually dominated. 89% either failed completely or did not dominate. Reason is very simple. Somebody with a better strategy can beat the first mover. Sam Walton, we funded Walmart when it was uh, expanding. Uh, he beat Kmart and Target. Kmart and Target were huge corporations. And this lone entrepreneur from Arkansas beat them. Think about that with a better strategy. Mark Zuckerberg beat MySpace. MySpace was Rupert Murdoch, perhaps the richest media guy in the universe. This lone student, 19-year-old student from Harvard beat him with Facebook. And I can go on and on about the importance of the strategy. So to me, the right product is just a platform. First mover doesn't give you any advantage because somebody else can look at what you're doing and improve on it. And I would suggest to all entrepreneurs, stop seeking first mover status, start to look at how you can improve somebody else's strategy in an emerging trend and take off. So that's the first two steps. The third and the fourth step, which is covered in Finance Secrets of uh, Billion Dollar Entrepreneurs, goes to the heart of the issue. How do you fund it? Because this is the, the problem. As I said, VCs talk as if they fund startups. They don't. They need to see potential. The reality is that VCs fund you know, it goes up and down a little, but about 100 out of 100,000 ventures. Now, how do they find those 100? That is a question. They need to see some evidence of potential. I call it aha, okay? Uh, and there are three kinds of aha. One is technology aha. We come up with a great technology. One is a strategy aha. And the third one is strategy and leadership aha. This is where the entrepreneur himself or herself is a stop. And so how does the regular entrepreneur fund the business from idea to aha, because the VCs won't be there. So what are the sources? And then when you get to the point where the VCs might be interested, should you take it? Because this is a key point. 76% of the billion dollar entrepreneurs, 76% did not use venture capital in my sample. And I studied about 87 billion dollar entrepreneurs, 87, okay, not one or two. And about, and I interviewed 3,300 million dollar entrepreneurs. So this is a huge sample. And if 76% did not use venture capital, it's worth studying, how did they do it? Dick Schultz, for instance, started Best Buy with $9,000, he borrowed it. Sam Walton started Walmart with 25,000, he borrowed it. Bob Kierlin built Fastenal with $31,000. He and five friends invested their life savings. Uh, Richard Burke started United Healthcare, which is the biggest healthcare company in the world with a loan of $40,000 and no equity. And all the examples I gave you did not ever use venture capital. So it can be done. And this is the point. Venture capital is very focused. They do great in Silicon Valley because Silicon Valley is filled with unicorn entrepreneurs. This is one of the key things to keep in mind. VCs do not start unicorns. Unicorn entrepreneurs start unicorns and light the flame. Once a flame has been lit, 
and it's been shown to be a great flame, the VCs then come and pour gasoline on it. Okay, that's how you need to look at venture capital. And Silicon Valley has bunches of flames, great entrepreneurs. But outside Silicon Valley, in inner cities, in low income areas, you need skills. That's what we need to teach. Business schools need to teach skills. Right now, they delegate entrepreneurship into a small corner of the management department. I think that's a crime. Uh, they are basically catering to the corporate community, but then I'm biased. So anyway, that's a long answer. And I appreciate the answer. I really appreciate how you expressed it. And you just made that last point around the importance of teaching skills and entrepreneurship, particularly in lower income communities. Could you talk a little bit more about those skills that you find to be extremely valuable for startup entrepreneurs? Sure. Uh, let me point out your skills and smart strategies. I mentioned the four smart strategies. How do you find the right opportunity? How do you find the right strategy? How do you find the right financing? And then the fourth one is how do you launch with limited capital? Because this is like a, uh, like a plane taking off with a limited runway. I used to get plenty of entrepreneurs when I was a financier who basically said, you know, I just ran through $500,000. I'm still failing. If I only had another 500,000, we never funded them because my reaction was, if you're failing with 500,000, you're gonna fail with my 500,000. Uh, so, you know, we were very careful with something like that. So how do you launch before the runway ends? How do you launch with limited capital so that people can then see that you're launching and then they'll, they'll come to you and they'll fund you? Okay, so now those are the four steps and you need to understand the strategies within those four steps. And that's what the books cover. Now, what about the skills? I break the skills down into three categories. The first category is how do you find your opportunity? What are the skills you need? Second is how do you uh, design and launch the venture? And this is actual taking off. And the third one is after you've taken off, how do you become a unicorn? How do you transform from a caterpillar to a butterfly? How do you transform from an entrepreneur to a founder CEO? How do you transform from a 19 year old unwashed kid called Mark Zuckerberg to the unwashed CEO he is today? Uh, the first three skills for finding the opportunities A, you need to have technical skills in an emerging industry. It's not just technical skills, but it's technical skills in an emerging industry. Bill Gates, new software in PCs. Mark Zuckerberg, new software in, in, in the, on the internet. Uh, Steve Ells, who started Chipotle, new, was a trained chef. And then he started Chipotle on the organic food trend. Sam Walton, new retail. Dick Schultz, new retail. Okay, so they had technical skills in an emerging trend and uh, Big Schultz and Sam Walton both jumped on the big box trend. The second trend that they ne needed at startup uh, or before startup is how to sell. This is one of the key things that most entrepreneurs don't have. Now they can form partnerships. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so I'm just saying, what do you need? And, and then if they form partnerships, that's even, that's great. Steve Jobs found Steve Wozniak. Steve Jobs knew how to sell and Steve Wozniak knew the technical skills. But you know, need to know how to sell and how to sell without any money. So this is not about branding and spending $2 million on branding. It's how to actually sell for cash. Like a Michael Dell. He built Dell by selling PCs and getting customers to pay in advance. So he used that money. A guy called uh, Neera Jain built Wayfair doing the same thing. A guy called uh, Tony Shea, I think, uh, built Zappos uh, doing the same thing. So how do you sell without capital? The third one is the one that's easily taught. I used to teach it. Uh, when I finance businesses, I've uh, financed about 400 business, 400 plus businesses. And we used to teach entrepreneurs. And then I would pick the best ones to fund. Uh, but the that is essentially... Finance, financial skills, not financing, but financial, entrepreneurial finance, not corporate finance, but entrepreneurial finance. How do you make $1 go further? Okay, that's entrepreneurial finance. 
Uh, corporations know how to make $1 into 90 cents. I'm just kidding. Uh, entrepreneurs need to know how to make $1 into two bucks. So that's the first set. The second set is how do you launch it? This is the financing skills. How do you actually fund the venture? Where do you find it? There are plenty of instruments, plenty of sources, plenty of how do you find the right one? So my book, Handbook of Business Finance, that you said you've bought deals with that. And that was my first book about 40 years ago. Uh, the second skill you need in that is how do you operate? Because uh, if you don't know how to operate, you're going to screw it up. And the third is how do you coordinate all of this to actually take off with limited capital, which means you need to do things like focus. Where do you focus? And then if you're focused on the wrong things, how can you stay flexible in order to pivot? So it's kind of three and a half skills. The financing, the operations, and the launching, and the pivoting. Once you've pivoted and taken off, uh, to give you an example, Sam Walton started out basically owning uh, Ben Franklin stores. He owned about 10 or 13 Ben Franklin stores in Arkansas. When the big store trend started in urban America uh, with companies like Kmart and Target, Sam Walton switched from his small stores to the big stores. And, but he focused on rural America. And we funded about three of his stores in rural areas. Uh, so how do you, uh, when you take off, uh, how do you become dominant? So the first thing is control skills. This is where, uh, where these entrepreneurs need to know financial analysis, not accounting, but how do you analyze the financial statements in order to run a better operation? you better know financial analysis of your company so that you know where you're screwing up and where you're doing well. The second is organizational skills. Uh, there are plenty of people that I hear, oh, you know, I, I need to control everything. Basically, they've just defined their upper limit. What these entrepreneurs know how to do is to delegate and yet control and grow. So delegate and be productive. Uh, hire the right people, keep the right people, fire the wrong people, motivate the right people, and then build a business. And, and they were all fantastic at that. And then the last one is leadership. How do you change from an entrepreneur starting out a business to running one of the world's biggest companies? I mean, think about it. We may or may, or may not like Zuckerberg, but he has managed that. Uh, Bill Gates managed it. Uh, Steve Jobs had a short intermission in Apple, but look at what he did. And he turned the company around too. So Jeff Bezos, look at what he's done, how he has transformed himself. Elon Musk, how he's transformed himself. Uh, you know, these are great transformations that they have accomplished. And uh, obviously it requires a lot of personal development. So how did they do that? What were the steps they took? And that's why I asked these entrepreneurs that I interviewed how they did it. And then I researched others. So those are the nine skills, or nine and a half. Once again, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'm curious when you pursued your doctorate early in your career, how looking back, it has helped you professionally when you were a financier, when you were running companies. Maybe you can reflect on that and perhaps share some stories where that came in really handy for you? Well, in terms of uh, actually helping me in my career, uh, it, has, it has done nothing. And, uh, and the reason is uh, my doctorate is in uh, management and operations. And uh, I moved to finance. And uh, essentially, I had taken one class in finance, but I studied every book and took a whole bunch of classes the first year I was in finance. Uh, and my family has been in finance. Uh, and so I got scuttled, but through dinner table conversations. Uh, and finance is not that difficult to understand if you kind of understand how to connect numbers to, to performance. And that's the key. Can you connect the numbers to performance? Uh, so when I ran five companies and turned them around, uh, essentially, I seem to have a gift to understand what is going wrong in a business and how to correct it. 
So in terms of the actual connection between the two, it didn't help that much. I got a PhD primarily because uh, my mother, mother wanted a doctor and I fainted the sight of blood. So I thought might as well get a PhD to make her happy. And uh, I hope she was happy. Well, that's certainly very commendable. So it's, it's nice to hear that uh, level of, of honesty around it. Um, what have been some interesting stories that come to mind when I ask the question around either very impressive entrepreneurs that you financed or interviewed or very laughable proposals that you've had to look at? I'm curious uh, what comes to mind. Well, I don't want to go into the laughable. I, I think we've all done things that looking back, uh, we cringe, uh, at least I cringe. And I'm hoping that uh, people are forgiving enough of my stupidities. Uh, and I'd like to be forgetful of theirs. Uh, but I think uh, some of the key stories were uh, when I ran my first big company, which was a meat company. Uh, it was a $60 million meat company, meat processing. And uh, I was a vegetarian until I was 18 or 19. So I knew nothing about me and uh, uh, no, I had no clue about the sausages, cuts, meats, whatever. I knew the difference between pork and beef. One came from a pig, the other came from a cow. But other than that, not much. And I was running this meat company. Uh, so it was really a great lesson in uh, how do you turn around a company you know, whether you know nothing about the industry. Luckily for me, uh, the problem in that company turned out to be that there were some people stealing stuff from the company. And uh, they were uh, tough guys and had uh, kind of put the fear of God in a few of the employees and they were able to get away with it. And, uh, and they had a very good uh, network to sell the stuff. And so not knowing me, I basically hired a cost accountant and started looking at pricing and all the th things you do from a financial perspective. And after about two or three months uh, of running that, I, I tried everything and I couldn't figure out why we were losing 10 to 15,000 per week. And so I went to my board and I said, I showed them the data and I said, I can't figure out what's happening. And, and if it's the angel's share, this is a very fat angel. Uh, I don't know if you know what the angel share is, but in Scotch, uh, the angel share is some of the Scotch evaporates. Uh, so you have less Scotch a year from now than now. Uh, you have the same thing in me, it, it kind of dries out. And, uh, but this is much more than the angel share. And so we hired detectives who went into the plant. And within two days, they knew exactly who was stealing. And uh, so we were able to catch them and uh, try to prosecute them. The prosecuting, whatever prosecutor in that county didn't think it was important enough. Uh, he must have had uh, bigger robbers than 10,000 to 15,000 a week, uh, but he didn't prosecute them, but at least we were able to find it. And then the company turned around and uh, and so when it turned around, we found out that uh, it needed all kinds of new investment to make the plant uh, much better. Otherwise, we couldn't compete because there was consolidation in the meat industry at the time. So we sold the company to uh, a group of investors, and uh, they sold it to this other guy called Lloyd Siegel. And years later, I had no clue this had happened. Yes, because I quit this company's board when they did something that I didn't agree with. Uh, and years later, I'm interviewing Lloyd for my book because he is a unicorn entrepreneur. And uh, I said, how did you get started? And as he was describing it, I said, wait a minute, that's the company I turned around. Uh, I'll tell you, there is an that's amazing- That's phenomenal. Exactly, it's an amazing coincidence in life. Uh, this guy had actually bought that company because that company was starting to go downhill again because they had lousy management. And uh, Lloyd is a guy who developed a product called Lloyd's Barbecue. And he was the first guy to vacuum pack uh, barbecued beef. 
and sell it. And he's a genius at marketing and a wonderful guy. I've invited him to FIU and he came uh, on his own dime. He has a house in Naples and, uh, and a house here. But uh, so Lloyd, uh, essentially I found out that Lloyd had taken the company I had saved and uh, made hundreds of millions from that. So that is uh, a great piece of news. And uh, so that's one. I have a few others, if you'd like. Yeah, please, let's, let's explore them as well. Uh, well, you know, there's another company that uh, where uh, we, were, we invested in the first company that developed the, uh, the semiconductor-based burglar alarm. So previously it was discrete components. This was an integrated circuit based uh, burglar alarm. And we did quite well. Uh, and then the same company, but the Silicon Valley people basically had more money. So this company wasn't doing well, but the same company developed a, uh, a wireless burglar alarm. And uh, so that company was spun off and uh, uh, and moved, so we sold our shares. But uh, years later, I ran into the guy who had purchased the company and moved, and I knew his name, and he's an entrepreneur in Minnesota. And he sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. And this was a pioneer in wireless burglar alarms. So uh, uh, again, fantastic story. And the third, uh, third one, where and the CEO of this third company is still a friend of mine, and I won't give you his name, but uh, uh, he and his partner started this company in the plastics in industry, and he didn't have much capital, but there was something in the way he talked, something in the way he would describe uh, uh, that I was impressed. So we approved the funding, and uh, years later I meet him. And we became great friends. And he had forgotten that I had uh, proved it because my assistant is the one who had worked with him. And I told him, you remember this company? And he said, yeah, I said, I'm the one who approved it. And we just uh, ended up laughing and uh, swapping stories. So uh, what I found is that uh, out of the 400 plus companies that we funded, two of them became billion dollar companies and seven of them became 100 to $900 million companies. Uh, it's a great feeling, you know, to know that you have uh, built some terrific companies. Absolutely the case uh, to see that you were involved and things come around full circle and you end up being friends with the people who were entrepreneurs. Uh, so I'm sure when they read your recent works, they're, they're probably wishing, oh, I wish I knew this a bit sooner, or I'm glad I knew this because they, um, they had those skill sets. Uh, I'm curious what excites you these days when um, you're working with students, when you're conducting more research and maybe still involved at, at some capacity in investing, what, what gets you excited these days? Well, one of my prime rules in life is uh, always start new things. Uh, not that the old things don't matter, but uh, when you start new things, it keeps you humble. And the reason it keeps you humble is because when you start a venture, nobody wants to deal with you because they know you're going to ask for something. And, uh, and there's an old phrase, I've heard it attributed to many people, including Mahatma Gandhi, that uh, uh, success has many fathers, failure is an orphan. Uh, and I can add to that, that before aha, you're an orphan. Nobody wants to touch you before aha. And so what I'm doing now is uh, doing my new thing. And uh, my wife thinks I'm nuts to start this at my age, but uh, to me, it's total joy. I don't need the money, it's just, uh, something that I think my time can be put to good use. And that is I'm trying to figure out a way to teach entrepreneurs, uh, all kinds of entrepreneurs, upper income, lower income, Harvard, non-Harvard, uh, how do you take off? And I 
teach at Harvard too in the summer. How do you take off without venture capital? Because I think, you know, if, if more people had skills and more people had the opportunity to make money, I don't think we should give people a silver platter, but we should give them a good education and the opportunity to succeed. Because when they succeed, they make other people around them successful and wealthier. Silicon Valley has succeeded because maybe a hundred entrepreneurs there built fantastic companies and look at how much wealth there is. Same with Minnesota. So what I'm trying to do is to teach everybody the skills. Now, the trouble with that is not everybody is going to be capable to use those skills to build a big business. But let's say if they go from zero to 1 million and do well, that's great. If they go from 1 million to 10 million, that's great. If they go from 10 to 100, that's great. So the point is skills never hurts. It helps to help you succeed and build a big business. So I'm trying to figure out how to start a school uh, or institute or whatever to do that. and. Uh, it has been a struggle, but uh, let's put it this way. It's a struggle that I love to uh, do because that to me is what passion is. Absolutely. That's really inspiring to hear. If we switch gears a little bit and you had the opportunity to enter a time machine and go back to any point in history and you could spend an afternoon with anyone, who would it be? An afternoon? Yeah. I think it would be uh, Andrew Carnegie. And uh, his was the first uh, biography I read, so he stays in my mind. And, uh, and I was about eight or nine when I read that and was totally impressed. And the fact, what impressed me the most was the fact that he gave away about $365 million. Uh, now, the fact that he was a bachelor and didn't have any children may have something to do with it, but nevertheless, giving away that much money is a phenomenal thing. And the question of how did he make it? And he made it by basically starting uh, US Steel and uh, what today is US Steel. And he was an immigrant from uh, Scotland and just a supremely talented person and how he built it. And the, there are two sides to him, just like there are two sides to Bezos and two sides to uh, Jobs and, uh, I'm not, not, sorry, not Jobs, Gates. Uh, how do you uh, see what these people did? And, and I've always kind of admired what Carnegie did at that time. And, of all the entrepreneurs, it'd be him or it would be Mahatma Gandhi because uh, how did he organize, quote unquote organize an entire country to win a war without a military? Uh, that is a fantastic task. And uh, he made the British ashamed of themselves, which is another task. Uh, and so I admire what he did and I admire how he did. So I think I wouldn't mind spending time with either one of these two people. You know, I'm not sure what's more impressive, all the insight that you've driven by interviewing all these entrepreneurs or, or the fact that you're reading a biography from Andrew Carnegie when you were eight. I think I was reading Curious George and, and picture books <laughs> at that age still. So that's phenomenal. Well, my dad had brought it home and uh, I just started it and couldn't put it down, so. Phenomenal. Well, Dilip, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'm looking forward to doing so again, but until next time, maybe you can share a parting thought. Uh, well, I, basically what I've told my children, Pursue your passion and make your parents proud. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for attending the business podcast and stay tuned for more episodes.